Hello, and welcome to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and I'm glad to bring you another quarantine edition. We spent the last few weeks discussing various aspects of combat in the Spanish Civil War. This time, we'll have a bit of a change of pace. Some time ago, we went into some detail on the interwar experience of the aviation arm of the United States Army, which was known in the latter part of that period as the United States Army Air Corps. This was only one of the Americans' military aviation services. A parallel development was taking place in the U.S. Navy. So today, we're going to fill in some of the context of American interwar air power by looking at the early days of naval aviation in the U.S., from the fledgling years of the early 1910s up to World War I. My major source for this one will be Naval Aviation in World War I by Adrian Van Wyen. This is a publication of the United States Navy's Chief of Naval Operations Office and consists of a collection of relevant articles from the Naval Aviation News, a periodical that is also published by the Navy. So now, let's go to the early days of the previous century, when in the last years of American isolationism, few pioneering enthusiasts were laying the inconspicuous foundations for what would be the gigantic colossus of later American naval air power. The American declaration of war against Germany, the U.S. Navy's aviation branch was tiny. Total personnel strength was 48 officers and 239 men. Total complement of aircraft was limited to 54 training airplanes, a free balloon, a kite balloon, and an unsatisfactory dirigible airship. The Navy had a single air station, then called an aeronautical station, at Pensacola, Florida. The Navy had only acquired its first aircraft six years before, and no operational aviation units of any kind existed. Most of the limited activity that was conducted in this field was concerned with training and the establishment of procedures. In April 1917, the infant aircrew training program was recovering from the effects of a six-month hiatus in operations. This pause was imposed after serious and dangerous flaws were discovered in the training planes then in use. Three and a half million dollars had been allocated to the development of naval aviation as part of the 1916 budget. But little impact of this increased funding had yet been felt. Some hopeful developments had been made using catapults for shipboard aircraft. The USS North Carolina was the first vessel to be fitted with experimental catapults, which had proven themselves workable. The ships Huntingdon and Seattle were in the process of being outfitted and trained in the use of scout planes launched off their decks using these new devices. Progress in overcoming the aircraft problem had been achieved in late 1916 when the Curtis N-9 was acquired to replace unsatisfactory trainers that had been used up to that point. The N-9 was a seaplane conversion of the Curtis JN-4, which is known popularly as the Jenny. It was a widely produced biplane that was also used to train army flyers. This plane was an excellent beginner's aircraft, relatively slow but with forgiving flight characteristics and good low-speed handling. The training program itself remained in embryonic form, with no established curriculum and no plans for the instruction of large numbers of airmen. The newness of aviation itself contributed to this problem, as very few people anywhere knew how to fly, and even fewer had any idea of how to systematically train others to do so. Most of the very few flying schools in the country were either operated by the aircraft makers themselves, such as that operated by Curtis in Buffalo, New York, or were part of clubs and voluntary associations of amateurs and enthusiasts. These voluntary organizations included clubs at Ivy League institutions such as Yale and Princeton, whose rich and connected students could afford the planes and fields to practice flying. Another initiative was the work of the National Coastal Patrol Commission, a civilian body funded by subscription, which undertook to establish surveillance flights over American coastal waters. Last and most important of these efforts outside the Navy were those of the naval militias. Naval militias were, and in some states still are, an American military organization run by the individual states of the Union as part of the so-called organized militia. These naval militia were generally not equipped for combat roles, but undertook such tasks as disaster relief and law enforcement support duties. Those of the East Coast states had procured a number of flying fields and conducted exercises with small numbers of land and seaplanes. Training within the Navy itself was limited to the aeronautical station at Pensacola. Before the war, no formal class structure had been established, and few candidates for flight training had been taught. Those that had were all graduates of the academy at Annapolis, and therefore basic naval subjects such as navigation, signaling, seamanship, etc. were not taught there. This would change in later years, as the station began to receive candidates for training straight from civilian life. Naval flyers did a great deal of the pioneering work in the extension of aircraft capabilities during these very early years. To cite one example, a Curtis A-2 flown by Lt. John H. Towers took off in the early morning hours of October 6, 1912 from the water near Annapolis. He stayed aloft for 6 hours and 10 minutes, 
setting an endurance aloft record for American airplanes of any kind. Another record would be set a few years later on the 3rd of December 1915, when the altitude record for seaplanes was set at 11,975 feet, or about 3,650 meters, by another naval officer flying a Curtis AH-14. The same pilot, a Lieutenant Southley, would better his record on the April 2nd of the next year by reaching 16,072 feet, or just shy of 5,000 meters. This man, however, would lose his life in another record-setting attempt, this time for endurance aloft, when he would crash after a flight lasting 8 hours and 51 minutes. First operations of aircraft as part of the fleet took place when some of the seaplanes of Pensacola were ordered to Fisherman's Point in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba on the 6th of January 1913. Here they took part in fleet maneuvers, scouting for the ships and spotting mines and submarines. The experience of these maneuvers convinced many Navy men of the enormous potential of aircraft in naval settings, and stimulated a good deal of effort and interest in the subject. In particular, the utility of aircraft in detecting mines and submerged submarines, which were much more easily visible from the air, was noted as very useful. First operational use of Navy planes came the next year. On April 20, 1914, an aviation unit consisting of three planes, three pilots, and 12 enlisted men reported to USS Birmingham in Pensacola. This ship then sailed for Tampico, Mexico to join elements of the Atlantic fleet already there, as part of the American intervention that year near Veracruz. A second detachment of two planes, one pilot, and three student pilots left the next day aboard the USS Mississippi, headed for the same destination. On May 6th, while on a scouting flight, a Curtis AH-3 seaplane flying here was hit by rifle fire from the ground. This was the first instance of a Navy plane taking enemy fire. The aircraft was unharmed aside from some bullet holes. The assistance of these few planes in the operations off the coast of Mexico convinced many officers, including then Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels, that aircraft had a major role to play in future naval strategy. When war came in April 1917, the Navy had little infrastructure in place to carry out the rapid expansion of aviation assets that was envisioned in the American war plans. The first phase of this expansion was marked by improvisation and the cooperation of private clubs and airplane manufacturers. Physical facilities themselves were lacking, and most of the initial flying fields and training schools were taken over by the Navy from private entities and the state naval militias. These were intended to serve as interim installations for training at coastal patrols while more permanent facilities were created. Some, such as the militia fields at Montauk Point, Rockaway Beach, and Bay Shore, would later be developed into regular naval facilities. The lack of a training establishment meant that in these first months, the Navy had to rely on other entities to train the majority of its first batch of aviators and aviation support personnel. 24 of the first candidates were sent to Toronto, where they were trained by the men of the RFC. These men were drawn primarily from students of the Princeton University and were intended to absorb some of the lessons that the British Empire's air forces had learned in combat in Europe so far. Ground school here included engine maintenance and repair, in which various aero engines were broken down and reassembled, and rigging classes in which students were taught general aircraft structural repair and how to patch canvas flying services. Similar practical instruction regarding armaments was also given by RFC armorers. After ground school, the men went on to basic flight training at Deseronto, a camp in eastern Ontario. After a few weeks here learning basic takeoffs and landings, they were sent to an advanced flying school at Camp Borden. Here they practiced long distance flight, dead stick landings, spin and stall recovery. Most of the training at Camp Borden, however, was devoted to tactical skills. Artillery spotting and wireless Morse telegraphy was a large part of the tactical course. To teach these two subjects, the Canadians built a huge mock-up map of a battlefield on the floor of a large room. The trainees were suspended above this floor in an observer station and learned to signal the fall of shot by reporting the locations of lights flashed at various points on the map in simulation of ordnance explosions. Bombing was simulated by the students sending out a wireless signal when at the point in the run when the bombs would be released. A man on the ground using a kind of theodolite would calculate the impact spot of the bombs based on the position and speed of the aircraft as it was tracked. A similar procedure was used to practice air gunnery with a camera gun. The results of the student's fire would be calculated by the position of a target on the resulting prints. A second phase of gunnery training used live fire from a Lewis gun at a towed sleeve target. For this purpose, the unarmed Jennies were fitted with a gun fixed to the top wing, which the student had to fire in flight while standing up in the rear cockpit. All tactical training was conducted on the basis of wartime technique as it evolved in Europe. 
Training flights here, as most everywhere else in the Americas, were accomplished using Curtis JN-4s. In this case, they were Canadian-built models. This aircraft carried no instruments aside from a tachometer and an altimeter. The Jenny was also underpowered, and had trouble in the often strong winds encountered in the northern Canadian fields. Frequent crashes, though rarely serious, would keep many planes out of service at any one time, as well as the equally frequent practice of student aviators putting their planes down in farmers' fields far from the training field. These planes would then have to be recovered, partially disassembled, and trucked back. These two factors resulted in a chronic shortage of trainers at the field. After completing this training, the men, like most of the first batches of trained men, were retained as instructors for later, larger classes to be taught in more permanent training establishments in order to disseminate the lessons of the Allies in the air war as far as possible. Most of these would become instructors at the expanding school in Pensacola, and many of the rest would do the same job at newly established air stations in the U.S. and Europe. One of these men, James Forrestal, would go on to become Secretary of the Navy under FDR. The involvement of institutions of higher education in the early days of naval aviation was crucial. Many of the first naval aviators were members of clubs established at Ivy League schools such as Yale in the immediate pre-war years. One, known as the first Yale unit, was a group of about a dozen undergraduates organized by a sophomore, F. Truby Davis. These enthusiastic collegians had been persuaded of the need for air patrols off the American coast, and it created a club of like-minded students. These upper-class youths used their connections among the American business and political elite to procure a seaplane and a qualified pilot to teach them at Locust Valley. By the end of the summer, four of them had soloed, and the remainder were qualified to do so. Seeking a way to employ these skills, they made attempts to be incorporated into the U.S. military effort now being assembled in response to troubles along the Mexican border. The Navy, however, saw another use for these men. A string of naval stations to fly coastal sea pain patrols was in the early stages of implementation. It was offered to the Yale students that they take part in this effort and man one of the stations. Despite their preference to participate in the Mexican action, they accepted this offer and were organized into the so-called First Aerial Coastal Patrol Unit. After the move, they received another pair of seaplanes, not from the Navy, but donated by rich relatives and friends, including F. Truby Davison's father, who was a partner in the J.P. Morgan firm. That fall, despite the continued civilian status, the patrol took part in fleet maneuvers conducted off of Sandy Hook. During this time, the students still attended classes. In March, as the war became increasingly certain, the men were enlisted into the Navy, and the unit transferred to West Palm Beach, Florida, where they could take advantage of the more favorable weather and engage in accelerated training. Afterwards, the unit would be moved back to Long Island. These men would go on to serve in various important posts in the U.S. and overseas during the war, representing as they did one of some of the first trained aviation reserve officers. Some commanded units are air stations abroad, but many served to establish schools and to train the larger groups of new men to come. Their fortunes were varied. The first U.S. Navy fighter ace, David Engels, was one of the Yale men of the first unit, as was Albert Sturtevant, the first naval pilot to be shot down. Two further Yale units of the same kind were also organized. Another university that contributed vitally to the beginnings of naval air was MIT, where the ground school was set up for the initial training of aviation recruits. Here they would study topics related to flying, such as flight theory, aerodynamics, engine operation and repair, as well as receiving their initial doctrination into naval discipline and physical drill. Later, classes for subsidiary subjects necessary for efficient air operations would be included. These included classes for certification of inspectors of engines and aircraft, and aerology, which we would call meteorology, which created the basis not only for naval weather stations but for the U.S. Weather Bureau as well. The MIT Ground School would be instrumental in the establishment of the basis of the Naval Air Service. In later years, many of its functions would be taken over by the Academy, and finally by the expanding training established at the new air stations envisioned in the expansion plan. These programs took some time to get going, however, and the first American flyers were sent abroad in an untrained state. One of the first American military units to arrive in France was the Navy's first aeronautical detachment. This consisted of 122 men. They arrived aboard two ships. First, the Collier USS Jupiter, departed alone for France from Hoboken, New Jersey. This was a ship whose association with Navy aviation would end only in 1942, by which time it had been converted into the carrier Langley, when it was sunk by the Japanese in the waters between Australia and the Dutch East Indies. The other, the USS Neptune, left Baltimore and headed for France at the end of May in company with the destroyers Jarvis and Perkins. 
They arrived at San Isaire after a 12-day journey on the 8th of June, the Jupiter having preceded them by three days. The French agreed to train these men using French aircraft. The French also undertook to build three air stations for the use of their American allies. Americans were housed for 10 days in old Napoleonic era barracks outside of Brest, while the current class of French students completed their courses. Training began at the basic French Army Flying School at Tours. The Americans started on June 22nd. They were divided into groups of 8 or 10 and assigned to a French instructor. These instructors spoke little to no English, a problem that was mirrored in the Americans' near total lack of French. Training was conducted using Codron G3 aircraft. These are two-seaters with wing warping controls and a 90-horsepower engine. Typical training flight here lasted about 20 minutes. The student sat in the forward cockpit and the instructor in the back. Verbal communication being impossible, the instructor would indicate turns to the student by tapping on one shoulder or another, and tell the pilot to raise or lower the nose by pulling back or pushing forward on the back of his head. After five hours of this kind of instruction, most Americans were ready to solo. The course of tours would be completed by a flight to the British field at Vendôme and back, 160 mile round trip, a dead stick landing into a target circle, and a one hour altitude flight at 8,000 feet, or a little more than 2,400 meters. Thomas W. Barrett, one of the American students here, would be killed during a training flight while at tours. He was the first Navy flyer to die in France during the First World War. After completing the basic course of tours, Americans were sent to the École d'Aviation Maritime at Hortin, located on a small lake near Bordeaux. Here they would receive their initial training on seaplanes, also conducted by non-English-speaking French officers. No barracks were located at Hortin, and the trainees lived in tents during their stay here. Seaplanes used for the training were the so-called FBA type, FBA being an acronym standing for Franco-British Aviation. These were pusher-type biplanes with a 90-horsepower rotary engine. Students here were qualified to solo after three 15-minute flights with an instructor. The Navy Flyers would remain at Hortine for about a month, and were then sent to the final French school at the Col d'Aviation de Saint-Raphaël on the Mediterranean coast. This was an advanced seaplane school, where the Americans would practice high-altitude flights, landing and handling their aircraft in rough seas, and tactical skills such as bombing, scouting, and gunnery. Training was conducted using a variety of French types, including FBAs, Telliers, Samsons, and Donet de Haute models. Upon completion of the course at Saint Raphael, the Americans were breveted to naval aviator status by the French. One of the Americans who had participated, Joe C. Klein, graduated the full course on October 17th with a total flying time of 31 hours and 52 minutes. His naval pay, he points out, is still that of an enlisted man, $17.60 a month. Many of the men of the aeronautical detachment would be sent on to other schools for more specialized instruction. About a third went to the French Army Air Gunnery School at Casso to qualify as artillery observers. Many of the others were sent to Italy, where they were commissioned by the Italians and later established the naval air station at Porto Corsini. One of these men, Hayes Hammond, would be awarded the Medal of Honor for his heroism in rescuing another naval aviator who was under attack by Austrian seaplanes while patrolling off the Austrian naval base at Pola. After completing all training, the remaining men in France were put to work building the first American naval air station in France at Mouchique. They performed this unpopular construction gang duty until others arrived from the U.S. to take over, and were then sent to Le Croissac, a station that was being constructed on the coast of the Bay of Biscay near Saint-Nazaire. The station itself was located on a small island separated from the coast by a canal. Americans began arriving here in late October, and began flying operational patrols on the 18th of November, using Tellier seaplanes equipped with a single 220-horsepower Hispano Suiza engine. Six of these aircraft were assigned to the station. These missions were flown in support of Allied convoys. Seaplanes would accompany the ships as they passed through their sector, which extended along the coast from Quiberon to Saint-Nazaire. Patrol flights would usually last for about four hours. One of these patrol seaplanes would be the first U.S. Navy plane to be lost on operations. This mission began on the 22nd of October, within a few days of the first Navy patrol missions flown from bases in France. Submarines had been reported south of Belle Isle, and one of the Telliers was sent to investigate. The aircraft was crewed by Ensign Kenneth Smith and two enlisted men, Homer Wilkinson and T.J. Brady. While cruising east of Point Breton at 50 meters altitude, the plane's engine failed, and the crew was forced to put the plane down in the choppy seas. They tinkered with the engine in an effort to restart it, but soon the light was failing and making work on it impossible. Faced with the night alone in the sea, 
They dispatched one of the plane's carrier pigeons with a message explaining their situation and estimated location. After a terrible night at sea, the men went back to work on the engine. They succeeded in restarting it and began taxiing back towards land. The aircraft had become damaged in the landing, and the left float had filled with water. Between the increased weight of the waterlogged plane and the rough seas, they were unable to make much progress on the surface. They would have nowhere near enough fuel to make it to safety on the surface. Despite the difficult conditions of the sea and the damage to their airplane, the crew decided they had nothing to lose and attempted a takeoff. This did not succeed, and resulted in critical damage to the left wing of the seaplane, which began to fold backwards. The damage caused the plane to begin taking on water, and as it rode lower and lower in the seas, it began to disintegrate. The men spotted Allied aircraft in the distance, but with no means to signal them, they failed to gain their attention. As night closed in, the seaplane became more and more submerged, eventually forcing the crew out of their positions and out onto the wingtip, the only part of the plane remaining above the waves. Luckily for the Americans, a French destroyer found them early next day. It was close, and the seaplane finally sank within minutes of the rescue. The crew were suffering from the effects of exposure, but were otherwise unharmed. This early experience confirmed the decision earlier in the expansion to concentrate naval aviation on seaplanes rather than land-based patrol planes, a decision that had been taken due to the unreliability of aircraft engines at the time. It also led to the inclusion of emergency gear on all Navy planes afterwards, including signaling devices such as flare guns, die markers, and smoke floats, as well as emergency rations and items such as sea anchors. The increased weight of this emergency gear also meant that American seaplanes would fly with crews of two instead of three. After some months at Le Crosac, some of the Americans were posted to another station at Brest. While they were here, they would receive their first American-built aircraft. These were Curtis HS-1s, powered by Liberty engines. When fully loaded for anti-submarine patrol, however, it was found that these aircraft were too heavy to take off. An extension of six feet was added to the wingspan, and the additional lift that this provided allowed them to fly in this heavily loaded condition. These extended span and seaplanes would be designated HS-2s. While these initial batches of naval aviators were training, the Navy was executing the initial phase of its expansion program. The Coast Guard was transferred to Navy authority by presidential order on the 7th of April. The naval militia fields in Squantum, Massachusetts and Bayshore, New York were taken over by the Navy on the 4th of May and assigned to the 1st Naval District to be developed as air training stations. By the 17th, plans were becoming more definite. On that day, the Secretary of the Navy issued a list of 20 priority areas to the War Preparation Program. Naval aviation was sixth on the list. A recommended procurement program was issued on the 23rd. This envisioned a force of 700 Navy planes, 300 trainers, 200 service seaplanes, 100 speed scouts, and 100 large seaplanes. Two Curtis types, the N9 and the R6, were recommended for the trainer and service seaplane categories, but no suitable aircraft existed to fill the other two roles. On June 20th, a couple days before the men of the 1st Aeronautical Detachment began their preliminary training in France, new Navy planes began to arrive at Pensacola. These were Curtis R-5s, twin float biplanes that would serve aboard cruisers and as trainers, as well as being used for some of the first earliest experiments with airdrop torpedoes. The 1st Marine Corps flying unit, known as the Marine Aeronautic Company, was established at the Marine Barracks in the Philadelphia Naval Yard on the 27th of April. This unit would remain here while some of its personnel were sent to MIT for ground school. In October, it would be divided into the 1st Marine Aviation Squadron and the 1st Marine Aeronautic Company. Same day, the Aeronautic Company was ordered to transfer to Cape May, New Jersey to begin training on seaplanes and flying boats. The 1st Marine Aviation Squadron would also leave three days later, in this case for an Army airfield at Mineola, Long Island, where they would train on land-based aircraft. The program of establishing patrol and training stations along the East Coast was put into implementation. The fields acquired in the first weeks after the declaration of war from the naval militias were developed into naval air stations. Most of these were outfitted to support the operations of coastal patrol seaplanes. Other specialized support facilities for training, repair, or lighter-than-air operations were made to some of these stations. They extended along the entirety of the American Atlantic seaboard from New England to Key West. Two others would be opened on U.S. territory, one at San Diego and the other at Coco Solo, which was in the Panama Canal Zone. In addition to bases in the U.S., the Navy approved a plan to build naval air stations overseas. The initial phase called for one training and three patrol stations in France. This was to be expanded to a total of 27 stations in France, England, and Ireland. The first of these, NAS Mouchique, 
will be commissioned on the 31st of August. This will be used for training as well as for seaplane patrol. First American flown seaplane, French built FBA type, would make its first flight from here on the 27th of September. Training operations would commence in October. Other patrol stations would be established along the French Atlantic coast. There would also be a station established at Poyac, which would be responsible for the assembly of Navy planes shipped to France and the repair of those operating there. The major limitation on the air expansion program, in the Navy as elsewhere, was the very small size of the American aircraft building industry. A variety of factors had kept American plane makers small. One big problem was the lack of a market. Aviation at this time was largely a matter of private clubs and enthusiasts flying from privately owned airstrips. Airlines did not exist, nor, for that matter, did airports. All the infrastructure of commercial flight, such as marked airways and radio beacons, lay far in the future. Until this time, the military, the other likely market, had procured only very small numbers of planes. Problems peculiar to a capitalist economy also greatly hindered the growth of the airplane industry. Insurance was extraordinarily expensive, not unreasonably given the unreliable nature of most aviation equipment at this stage. A much bigger obstacle involved the numerous patented devices used on the aircraft. Any one design might use dozens of devices patented by numerous individuals and companies, and the overlapping claims of these patent holders made the production of any advanced aircraft not only helplessly complex, but also very likely to result in numerous lawsuits. This patent problem had severely retarded the growth of the American aviation industry before the war. So bad was this problem that the government realized that any rapid wartime expansion using up-to-date planes would be impossible in the face of it. A special commission was set up using the extraordinary executive wartime powers, and a compromise licensing arrangement was imposed in order to make mass production possible without the process becoming bogged down hopelessly in endless litigation. In the face of this lack of productive capacity, the Navy, like the Army, sought an answer in the subcontracting of much of the work to industries with similar procedures. For example, much of the construction of airframes of wartime aircraft was contracted out to furniture makers, whose extensive woodworking experience made the changeover a simple matter. Unlike the Army, however, Navy also decided on another means to increase the availability of planes. They set up their own factory. This was built at the Philadelphia Naval Yard. The site was chosen due to the availability of land for the construction of the complex and its convenience to sources of materials and labor. Aside from the production of Navy planes, the factory would benefit the service by conducting research and development work, and its operation would give the Navy practical data regarding costs and prices when contracting with private companies. In June 1917, the Navy tasked Commander F.G. Coburn with creating specifications for a plant capable of producing 1,000 training seaplanes, or their equivalent, each year. He was also to determine the cost of such a project. To do so, he consulted with most of the leading private manufacturers, especially Curtis, who had perhaps the greatest experience building seaplanes, and whose plant at Buffalo, New York was the only aircraft factory in the nation that could be considered capable of quantity production. Coburn made his report in July, and on the 27th, Secretary Josephus Daniels approved the appropriation of $1 million for the project. The factory complex was to consist of four buildings, the factory itself, a wood drying kiln, a dry lumber storehouse, and a boiler and powerhouse. These were to be built as permanent structures rather than temporary wartime constructions to cite the somewhat higher cost. The construction work was estimated to take 100 days. Ground was broken on the 10th of August, the first powered machinery was installed on the 16th of October, and the entire plant was completed and ready for production on the 28th of November. Commander Coburn was assigned duty as its manager. First employee, a mechanic, had been hired on the 1st of October. Provision of labor was a persistent problem, given the highly specialized nature of the work. This required a good deal of initial training. Airplane production was altogether an infant art, and few workers were skilled in its techniques. Of the 400 engineers and technicians that the plant would hire, no more than 10 had any previous experience with aircraft of any kind. A training division would be established at the factory not long after its establishment. This was created to teach enlisted men headed overseas how to assemble aircraft packed in shipping crates and some basic structural repair. First class of 50 men from Pensacola would arrive on the 28th of January 1918. And though the original plan had called for the production of training seaplanes, the availability of planes of this kind from other sources, as well as the more pressing need for patrol and anti-submarine aircraft, meant that these types were put into production instead. The specific model chosen was the Curtis H-16, a twin-engine flying boat. 
It's a large aircraft with a wingspan of 96 feet, or about 30 meters. It was powered by 400 horsepower 12-cylinder Liberty engines and carried a moderate bomb load, as well as four defensive machine guns. A crew of four or five men, including a pilot, one or two observers, an engineer, and a radio operator was typical. The original construction plans for the H-16, as they were used at the Curtis plant, proved to be far too general for the much less skilled workforce employed at the Naval Aircraft Factory. The plans were redrawn, laying out the construction and fabrication processes in a much more explicit, step-by-step -step fashion. The first H-16 built at the factory set off on its maiden voyage on the 27th of March, 1918. A few days later, this plane and a second H-16 were packed up and shipped across the Atlantic to Kellingholm, England. This pair would be the first of 50 seaplanes built to fulfill the Navy's initial order. The rest of this first batch would be completed by the 7th of July. As the early months of the expansion continued, estimates for the number of aircraft that the factory would be called upon to produce were revised upwards. Part of this meant that an additional order for another 86 H-16s was placed. However, more aircraft would be needed soon than the existing plan could reasonably be expected to produce. In order to meet this increased target, an expansion of the facilities was needed. The expansion plan called for an enlargement of the assembly area, construction of a six-story storage facility, three-story office building, a large hangar area, and waterfront improvements. This expansion was completed in the summer of 1918 at a cost of a little more than $4 million. H-16 production was continued during the building of the new facilities. The new assembly area featured three bays, a large 100-foot bay in the center for final assembly, equipped with a pair of 10-ton overhead cranes, and two 50-foot bays on each side for sub-assemblies, each equipped with a 2.5-ton crane. In February, the number of H-16s ordered was increased to 150. To help meet this goal, much of the work was contracted out to small companies, including sheet metal shops and furniture makers, as well as other airplane manufacturers. A branch office of the Naval Factory was established at each subcontractor's plan to ensure the quality of the goods produced and to help coordinate the needs of the Navy and the contractor. Labor involved was significant. The factory itself had a workforce of 3,700 people. Approximately 7,000 more were employed by the subcontractors. By the end of the summer of 1918, production had been switched to the new F-5L flying boat. This is a slightly larger design, capable of carrying a greater payload and staying aloft for a longer time. It was based on a British design, the F-5, the designs for which had been provided to the Navy Department by the British Admiralty. As had been the case for the H-16, these plans had to be withdrawn to accommodate the step-by-step -step plans needed for efficient mass production. The redesign included an adaptation of metal parts to American fabrication methods, a redesign of the engine mounts to take the American Liberty engines, and a revision of the structure of the main hull, which had been considered weak in the British original. The revised F-5L went into production as the H-16s were wound down. By the end of June, seaplanes were being completed at a rate of one per day. By the end of the year, the Naval Aircraft Factory had built 183 twin-engine seaplanes. 150 of these were H-16 and 33 F-5Ls. In addition to these production numbers, the factory had repaired numerous damaged seaplanes and built several experimental aircraft, including the N-1 testbed for the recoilless Davis anti-submarine cannon, and prototypes for the Sperry Unmanned Aircraft Program. When the armistice came, all subcontractor orders were cancelled and all flying boats not in an advanced stage of construction were abandoned. The factory itself remained, but by the summer of 1919 the workforce had shrunk to 1,400. Gradually over the coming years, its functions and responsibilities would be divided up among other Navy and Federal agencies. One item that the aircraft building program could absolutely not do without was a suitable engine. Like the aircraft industry itself, the American aero engine industry was embryonic at the beginning of the war. The only airplane engine maker of any size was once again Curtis, and the engines of this company were low-power designs useless for combat planes. What the U.S. did have, however, was a very large and productive automotive industry. In order to acquire a design for an airplane power plant that could be readily mass-produced, quickly, it was decided to adapt the basic design of current automobile engines. Designers from a number of car makers were brought together and in a few days had produced the plans for the Liberty engine, one of the major achievements of American industry during the war. The design was simple and used a large proportion of existing off-the-shelf components. The engine had a modular design which not only lent itself to assembly line production, but allowed the building of four, eight, and twelve cylinder versions with little change in the manufacturing process. In practice, however, the overwhelming majority of Liberties produced would be the 400 horsepower V12 model. 
Progress in getting the Liberty into production would be equally rapid. The first prototype, an eight-cylinder model, was delivered to the Bureau of Standards in Washington, D.C. for testing on the 4th of July. This was barely six weeks after the initial design work had begun. It was built by Packard from components produced at many plants scattered around the country. The engine proved sound, and work went ahead on pre-production models. On the 25th of August, the 12-cylinder Liberty passed its final 50-hour run test and was approved for mass production. Thousands of V-12 Liberties would come off the lines of American factories, and would power every American combat plane and many of those of the Allies, not just during the war but for years afterwards. Indeed, the sheer number of cheap, surplus Liberty engines left over from the war would constitute a serious obstacle to post-war engine development. In addition to airplanes, the Navy operated a number of lighter-than-air aviation units. These used kite balloons, free balloons, and airships. The first Navy airship, the DN-1, was flown at Pensacola on April 20, 1917. Fortunately, it was found to be fundamentally unsound and was grounded after the second test flight. The wartime expansion plan called for a lighter-than-air training establishment. The Navy had very few experienced personnel or specialized equipment for this purpose. As had been the case with heavier-than-air aviation, assistance was sought from the private sector. In this case, the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, principal operators of these kinds of aircraft, was approached. The company offered the use of their facility at Akron, Ohio, for the training of lighter-than-air aviators for the Navy. The training station was established on the shores of Lake Frisch. When the first trainees arrived in late May, the site was still under construction, with a leveled landing field, partially built hangar and hydrogen generating plant, student barracks and officers quarters. The construction, which was undertaken by Goodyear also, was completed shortly afterwards. Training and equipment would also be provided by the company, with the exception of training in purely naval subjects such as seamanship, signaling, and communications. Early on, basic ground school subjects would also be taught here, but as the school at MIT expanded, these would be discontinued at Akron. Lighter than air training began in kite balloons tethered to a winch by a cable. Three kite flights were made at an altitude between 1 and 2,000 feet. These were intended to familiarize the students with the sensation of being aloft and to provide experience in reading basic instruments. Flights in free balloons then followed. Three were flown with an instructor, and the student was taught how to control the direction of the balloon's flight by rising or descending to meet air masses moving in the desired directions. The student then took the balloon up solo twice. On each solo balloon flight, the student was expected to unpack and inflate the balloon before ascending, as well as deflating and repacking it after landing. The student then moved on to airships. The B-class blimp was used for training. It's a relatively small three-man machine. The gondola, which was suspended under the gas bag, was a slightly modified Curtis JN4 fuselage. The blimps were also powered by the Jenny's OX series engine and the nose of the gondola. The blimps had fins at the rear with rudders and elevator surfaces. The envelope of the main gas bag contained three smaller gas bags. The larger central one contained the hydrogen, while the fore and aft bags were filled with air. A blower motor was used to evacuate or fill the airbags, thus changing the weight distribution of the machine and razoring and lowering the nose. These air-filled ballonets also served the important purpose of providing pressure on the one full of hydrogen, which otherwise would expand as the airship rose to higher altitudes with lower outside air pressure and warp the envelope out of shape. Later models of the B-Class would replace the blower motor with an air scoop placed to pick up the prop wash. Three men rode in the B-Class. A student would normally make 18 flights in them. First five, the student rode in the rearmost cockpit and had responsibility for operating the engine. In the next five, he would progress to the middle seat, where he'd operate the blower if the blimp had one, and learn the flight controls by using a duplicate set. Finally, the student would move on to the pilot's position in the front cockpit and make three flights in command of the airship. After that, he was ready for lighter-than-air pilot qualification. The first class at Akron, consisting of only 11 men, graduated on the 26th of September. These men, like those of the heavier-than-air trading cadres up to this point, were either retained as instructors of future classes or sent to coastal patrol stations in Europe or on the East Coast. Training would continue throughout the year, the Navy gradually taking over more and more of the operation from Goodyear as time went on. And that is where I'm going to end this episode. Next time, we'll go on to examine some of the aircraft and equipment that these men of the expanded naval air units would employ their new skills in using. We'll also take a look at the wartime operations of the new Navy and Marine pilots. We'll also cover a few of the special projects that the Navy had in development at this period. I didn't really know much about this pre-carrier portion of the U.S. Naval Air history, 
and I was surprised to find the variety of developmental ideas that were being pursued at this time. So I hope you join me next for some of that. So I hope that you found some of this interesting or useful, and I hope that you and yours are doing well this week. I hope that this next week brings you only good things. As you know, you can find me on Twitter at ArmsRecord, and if you like, you can find video versions of my episodes on my YouTube channel. So until next time then, as always, I remain Mark7, wishing you all the best.